morning, we are continuing in our Red Letters series um, where we have been looking at the words of Jesus. Maybe you guys have opened up your Bibles and you've noticed that some words aren't in the black print, but they're in the red print, and those are the words and the teachings of Jesus. And maybe you've been following along all summer, we've been doing this for the last couple months, uh, or maybe you've kind of been jumping in and out, or you're just checking us out today for the first time. But the reason that we're doing this series, the kind of the heart behind it, is actually your first filling on your notes, and it's this, the source of the words determines the weight of the words. The source of the words determines the the weight of the words, right? You know this to be true. I know this to be true. That just because you hear something doesn't necessarily mean that you believe it. It depends on maybe who told you or the source of that information, right? For example, I'm a big movie buff. Anybody love to go to the movies? I love the movies. And I have found that before I go and spend 10 or $12 on a movie ticket, I will ask someone who's maybe seen that movie before, hey, what'd you think of the movie? And I have realized over the years that not all movie reviews are created equal. Right? Not all opinions are the same. And I, I can't even trust Rotten Tomatoes anymore because I feel like they have certified fresh some movies that are real stinkers. Uh, but there are a few people that I know that I can trust and I can ask, hey, how is that movie? And I know that I can trust their opinion, right? Because the source of the words determines the weight of the words. Which, by the way, uh, if you're just checking out church maybe for the first time in a while or you're kind of exploring Christianity, you should know that Christianity isn't based on a set of ideas. It's not based on a system of religion. Actually, the foundational piece of the Christian faith is a person. And that person is Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, who lived and walked the earth a couple thousand years ago, who wasn't just a good teacher, who wasn't just a good person, or this guy who did some miracles, but actually Jesus made a claim. He claimed to be God himself, the Messiah, which wasn't really that unique of a claim because people throughout history have claimed to be God. And even at that time, people had claimed to be the Messiah before. But what made Jesus unique and what set him apart was that he predicted his own death and his own resurrection and then pulled that off. And it's because of this, it's because of who Jesus is, that for those of us that are Christians, those of, those of us that have decided to follow Jesus, his words should carry the most weight in our lives. More weight than what we might think or our own opinion, more weight than our favorite news station, right? They should carry more weight than what culture tells us, not because of what Jesus says, even though what he says is really good, but because of who Jesus is, because the source of the words determines the weight of the words. And so uh, today, um, we are going to look at some words of Jesus that are actually really, really important. Uh, and to kind of set up um, the, the scene here, um, if, if we get these red letters right, if we can get the things that Jesus is going to that we're going to look at that Jesus says today, if we can get those right, it actually has the ability to make his message more believable. Jesus actually tells us that if we as, as the church, if we can get this thing right that we're going to look at today, it has the power to make his message of forgiveness and hope to the world more believable, which should excite us as a church. Because if there's something that we can do that you and I can get right as followers of Jesus so that our neighbors or our coworkers or friends and family that haven't decided to follow Jesus, that that message could be more believable, then we should be all in. And so I want to give you some context before we jump in and look at these letters. Um, what's happening here is Jesus is praying, and he's praying for a specific group of people. He, he, he will look at it, but he, he says that he's praying for his disciples, and he says not just his disciples that were in the room with him when he was praying, but he's praying for all who would come to faith in him, all who would believe their message. So what's really cool is what we're going to look at today is Jesus is praying, not a prayer just for his disciples back then, but even for you and I today. He's praying for the church. And as Jesus is praying for the church, he begins to paint a picture of what the church should be, of, of what a group of followers of Jesus should look like, what it was intended to be, what it's supposed to be, which is important for us to understand this because in our American culture today, there actually can be a lot of misconceptions of what church is. And, and we've seen this, maybe th this might not be your experience with church, but I, I feel like this is kind of definitely our culture's view of church, that church has kind of just become this event that happens on a Sunday. It, it, church is kind of in our culture, kind of just become this, this building that people attend on the weekend. 
And, it, and it's this Sunday event that people actually are attending less and less frequently and they're engaging with less and less frequently and people are become less and less interested with this event of church in our culture. In fact, um, a study found that for the first time in eight decades, Americans' membership in houses of worship dropped before the, the majority line, 50% for the first time, 47%, compared to 70% in 1999. And so over the last couple of decades, we've seen a 20% drop in just American engagement with houses of worship. And I want to suggest to you this morning that maybe part of the reason that people are engaging with the church less and less frequently, that people are attending less and less frequently, maybe is because church was never meant to be a Sunday event. Maybe, maybe church was meant to be more than just this building or this thing that people go to on the weekends. Maybe church was supposed to be more than just this religious uh, box that you check off just to kind of make sure you're good with the, the man upstairs. Maybe it was supposed to be more than that. In fact, those of you, some of you know this and you'll get really excited, but maybe we are supposed to be the church. And, and if you look at church and how this whole thing started, and if you even go and read the book of Acts, you, you'd find that for, for the early Christians, that church wasn't just this event that happened on the weekends. It wasn't just this building that people go to. In fact, they didn't even have buildings. They just met in homes. But church looked a lot more like a family. It, it looked more like a group of people that loved and cared for one another, that actually sacrificed things for each other. That, that put each other before themselves. It was, it was this group of people that were so committed to one another. They were on mission together to serve and to care for those around them and to bring this message of Jesus to the world that needed it. You, you'd find that church looked a little bit different than maybe it does today in our culture. And I think the question that we should ask is, well, why does it, if, if that's how church is supposed to be, if that's what it was intended to be, then why doesn't it always feel that way? Well, I, I think there's probably a lot of different reasons, right? Like any family or any group of people, there can be, you know, dynamics that are unhealthy or there can be dysfunction within families. And so there can be the same within the church. Like for, for example, sometimes in, in church, we can, we can harshly judge one another, or, or maybe we can hold on to bitterness or resentment and we don't extend grace, we don't extend forgiveness, or we just can't get over our differences, and that's all we can focus on is, is our different, differing opinions and our differing views. And so it's hard to be united. It's hard to be a family when all you can focus on is your differences. Or maybe sometimes we just never really show up for each other. And so it's hard. We can't really know what's going on in each other's lives. Or, or life just gets so busy that we don't really prioritize coming together and we don't prioritize growing our faith together. Sometimes, sometimes in church, there's a, there's a group of insiders and they love to be the insiders, and so they don't really make the outsiders feel like insiders. Right? There can be all sorts of different reasons and dynamics that can play into the church not feeling and being the way that it was intended to be. And for some of you here this morning, when I say that church it, it was intended to be a family, some of you say, yes, that is my experience with the church. Some of you even here would say, yes, that is my experience at Riverway. Riverway is my family. This is my people. This is my group. And if that's you, that's awesome. Like, we're, we're genuinely glad for you. That's amazing. That's incredible. In fact, but you should know that that's not everybody's experience with church. And in fact, that might not even be everybody's experience here at Riverway. And in fact, if that's you and you say, yes, Riverway is my family, you should know that you actually have a responsibility to help others feel the way that you feel when it comes to church. Because there, there might be another group of you here this morning that if, if you were honest with yourselves, that, that you would say that church for you, your experience with church is that it's this hour-long event on a Sunday that you drag your kids to, and then when service is over, you have some awkward small talk, and then that's kind of it. Right? And, and that's just, that's just not, to, not to shame you or guilt you. That's just where you're at. And, and my question for those of you, if that's, if that's kind of the group that you fall into, your experience with church or your view of church, my, my question to you is, don't, don't you want more than that? 
I think we all do. We all want more than that. There's something that's so enticing. There's something that's so attractive about being a part of a group of people that loves one another, that actually knows each other and knows what's going on in each other's lives, that, that would actually uh, stop what they're doing to help that person. Like, like you would love to experience a community, a group of people that you know if there was something going on in your life, you could call someone and say, hey, this is what's going on. And that group of people would move mountains to help you. And, and you would love to be that person for someone else too. We would all love to experience that version of church. So how do we experience that? How can that be our experience when it comes to church? And so what we're going to look at today is uh, found in the, the book of John. It's recorded by the disciple John, John chapter 17. And if you opened up your Bible to John chapter 17, you would actually find the title of that chapter would read, Jesus' Final Prayer. And so what's happening here is these are some of the last hours, some of the last moments before Jesus would be arrested, before he would be tried, and before he would eventually be crucified. And so he just got done having his last meal with his 12 disciples. You guys probably know it's famous, the Last Supper. And so now he's having this last moment of prayer over his followers. Now think about that just for a minute. Think about that. If you could pray for anything right now, what would you pray for? If you could pray for anything right now, what would you pray for? Some of you, maybe that would be to get that promotion. Or maybe you would pray for right now just more time in the day. Anybody? Like, there's just not enough time to get anything, everything done. I need more time in the day. Right? Maybe, maybe you would pray to find a house in your budget or for your budget to be bigger so you could find the house that you actually want. Right? Or, or maybe if you could pray for anything right now, it would just be to get through the next semester of school or the next season of work without burning out because life just feels like it's so much right now and you just want to get through it without burning out. Or maybe if you could pray for anything right now, it might be something less serious. Like maybe you would pray that your favorite TV show would finally release the next season, right? Like, come on, writer's strike, end. I, I need my entertainment. Or maybe parents in the room, maybe parents, you would, you would pray that, if you could pray for anything right now, it would be that your kids would finally start loading the dishwasher because you are sick of picking up after them, right? But if you could pray a final prayer, if you had to pray a prayer at the end of your life, what would you pray for them? And that's, that's a tougher question because what you pray for right now is different than what you would pray for in the end because you probably wouldn't pray for the new house or the promotion or for your favorite TV show to finally release the new season. It'd probably be something different. And wouldn't it be fascinating to know what Jesus would pray for in a moment like that? Well, thankfully, we don't have to wonder or guess because John wrote this down, and that's what we're gonna look at this morning. So this is what Jesus prayed for in the end. He said, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. So G Jesus is praying, again, not just for the disciples that were in the room, but he's praying for you and me. He's praying for the church, and this is what Jesus prays for the church. He could pray for anything, but watch what he prays for. He says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. And Jesus, in the end, when he could pray for anything for the church, he prayed for you and I to be one. He prayed that all of his followers would be united. Think about that. Jesus didn't pray for strength for the church. He didn't pray for money or resources for the church. Jesus didn't even pray for courage for the church. He didn't pray that, that you and I, that we would be right about everything and that we could win all of the debates and win all the arguments and win the culture wars of the people that have different views than us. No. Jesus prayed that his church, that his followers would have a sense of togetherness, that they would be united. And being united means to be for 
each other. It means to work with each other. It means to encourage one another. It means to pray for each other. It means to actually know what's going on in each other's lives so that we can show up for each other. It means that you fight for each other, that you fight for unity, no matter how different we may be. And what's cool is that this idea of Jesus' followers being united as one was actually as radical of an idea back then as it even is now. Because, you know, we've seen over, definitely over the last several years, how the church has been divided on so many issues, and there's so many different opinions and different personalities and different things going on. We've seen how the church has been divided. And actually, this idea of the church being united as one was as radical of an idea back then as it is now, because the 12 disciples were actually all very different. They, they were all Jewish boys, yes, but they all came from different walks of life. And I think, I think sometimes when we read the Bible and we read the stories, we think, oh, the 12 disciples, they must have been best friends, they must have been best buddies. But that probably wasn't true, because as Jesus is praying this, one of the 12 was Matthew. And Matthew, before he decided to follow Jesus, he was a tax collector. And, and tax collectors were the worst of the worst people. The Jewish people hated the tax collectors because what the tax collectors would do, they were recruited by the Roman Empire to tax their own people and to bring the money to the Roman Empire that was oppressing the Jewish people. And, and if tax collectors like walked through the markets, they, like Jewish people would probably spit on them and you would never hang out with a tax collector because they were the worst. They were the biggest sinners. And here's Matthew sitting in the room, a former tax collector, and Jesus says, I pray that you would all be one. And, it, and it's probable that Matthew probably cheated some of those other disciples and their families. And now Jesus is saying, yeah, I, I, I'm praying that you would all be united. I would imagine there was some tension in some of those relationships. There was some tension in the room. Another one of the 12 was Simon, Simon the Zealot. And, and what the Zealots were before following Jesus, Simon was a part of the zealots, and they would oftentimes plan and execute assassinations on other Roman officials or other notorious sinners, all in the name of God. They were very, a very extreme group. And Simon left that group to follow Jesus. I would imagine that probably put the group in uh, some danger, and there was probably some tension in the relationships, and Jesus is praying that they would all be one. Peter, Peter was loud and abrasive and and, and had a, temp, a temper from what we can tell in, in Scripture, and probably one of those personalities that, you know, it, it was hard to be around. But Jesus prayed that they would all be one. The disciples, oftentimes, they would compete with one another, and they would argue about who was the greatest among them, and there was some tension. And over time, the church just grew, and it, and it got a lot bigger. So imagine how many more opportunities there were for disagreements. How many more opportunities there were for gossip and backstabbing and arguing and bickering. All the things that can destroy a group. All the things, even worse, that can make a group of people unattractive to outsiders. Like, why, why would I want to be a part of them? All they do is argue and bicker and gossip about one another. And look at something that Jesus says one more time. Jesus said, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Jesus is saying that the way that we treat one another will impact how people view God. In, in fact, it's your next fill-in on your notes, that our unity will make Jesus' message more believable. And our disunity will potentially do the opposite. Or even our indifference with one another can potentially do the opposite. And unity doesn't mean that we agree on everything all the time, but it does mean that we, we seek to move forward together, that we fight for unity, that we pray for each other, that we encourage each other, that there's a sense of togetherness. And I know that you guys experience the tension in all of this because let's be honest, like it, it would kind of be a lot easier and it, maybe it would be nice sometimes if we could kind of just pick and choose a little bit who we have to be united with, right? Who's kind of invited into this thing and who's kind of maybe even sometimes a part of this thing called 
the church. And here at Riverway, we, we say this a lot, and this is kind of the mantra that everyone is welcome here. And, and it's our mantra because it's the kingdom of God's mantra. I mean, that's what God says, that all are welcome. All can come. And that's inspiring, and that is exciting, and that's something that you want to get behind, and it's awesome, and it's incredible. Everyone is welcome here until it isn't, until it gets a little bit messy, until, until the tax collector that cheated your family is now invited in, right? And, and it's something that's really exciting and inspiring to get behind, but that is something that's a lot more difficult to actually live out and to be united. I know you experienced the tension in all this because that's what the first disciples experienced. They experienced it too. And I think it's because of this impossibility and because of the difficulty of, all, of, of this all that it makes the message of Jesus more believable. That, that we could be, as, as a group of Riverway, we could be here and we all be different and come from all sorts of different walks of life and people could say, wow, they're, they're all different, but there's something, they're just, there's some togetherness there. They, they really love each other. They really show up for each other. I mean, they, they may not agree, agree on everything. They may vote differently. They may, there may, may be some differing in opinions, but they love one another. They are united. And there's something about that that says, wow, God must really be at work in them. And it's because how we love and treat one another, our unity becomes a way for the world to see God at work. So, so how do we become more unified? Right, the world is always going to be divided. It's always going to be polarized. We've seen that over the last several years, how divided our country has been on so many different issues. But how can the church do the opposite? How can the church stay unified? And actually, the bigger question is, whose responsibility is it that the church stays unified? Wh whose responsibility is it for the, to, to protect and to promote the unity of the church? Well, it's, it's your next fill-in that unity begins with you. Unity begins with me. It, it, it begins with all of us. It's, it's, it's not like staff's responsibility. There's no like unity committee, and they're just going to make sure that everybody stays unified, right? It's not the board's responsibility. It, it's all of our responsibility. We all are responsible for our own contribution to the unity of the church. And this is good because it actually gives us a lot of control and, and there's a lot of responsibility because we can't help what everyone else was do, will do, but we can help what we do. All right, it begins with you. It begins with how you interact with people when we meet together on a Sunday. It, it begins with you and how you choose to talk about people from church. It begins when, when how, how you're going to react when a, a follower of Jesus frustrates you. What are you going to do? It begins when you realize that you aren't exempt from Jesus' prayer of unity. And, and for unity to work and to get the attention of others, we oftentimes, we have to be the ones to make the first move. We have to say hi first. We have to reach out first. We're going to have to forgive first or maybe be willing to compromise first. We're going to be the ones that have to make it a priority to commit to one another and to show up and to be here. We're going to have to be the ones to welcome the new person first or to initiate the tough conversation rather than go and talk to everyone else about it, but go initiate a tough conversation. We're going to have to be the ones to make the first move. And this is difficult because oftentimes we want someone else to make the first move, but the reality is it begins with you and it begins with me. And there's so much riding on this, so much riding on our unity as a church. Jesus knew this. That's why he prayed. At the end of his life, the thing that he prayed for, for you and me, for the church, was for unity because he knew how difficult this would be. He knew how busy our lives would be and how easy it would be just to kind of drift apart and not stay together. Je Jesus knew how, how hurt we could get with one another, how frustrated we could get. He knew how different we are, and so he prayed that we would be one. And we have to get this right. This isn't optional for us because God wants to do so much over the next few years. I really believe that, that God wants to use our church, wants to use Riverway to do so much in this community, in this city. And it's gonna come down to, can we stay united? Can we have a sense of togetherness? If we're gonna accomplish the mission that Jesus gave us, we have to have unity. And, and soon after 
Jesus left earth, the church started to change the world big time because nobody had ever seen a group of people that were so different, that came from all different cultures, all different backgrounds, stand together And they had never seen a group so committed to one another, so committed to staying together, to working together, to serve and to care for those around them. And it was the unity of the early church that changed the first century world. And it allowed the message of Jesus to change the world. Imagine if that could also change your family. If it could change your communities. If somehow when, you, when you're going to work, people could just see that something's different with this group of people or your neighbors, and they, they want to be invited into not just a place to come on a Sunday and warm a chair, but a community of people that loves one another. Imagine if it could change the city. And so what I want to do is I want to leave with you with a question this morning, an action step. And that's this. How could you today work toward unity? How could you today work towards the unity of this group? Who, who could you celebrate? Who do you maybe have to initiate a tough conversation with? Or, or who do you have to forgive? Or who, who is someone that you could reach out to and say, hey, after church, we should go get lunch because I just want to get to know you more. Or, or maybe for those of you that are in small group, who is it that you could invite to join you in small group to, to come into deeper relationship? And, and maybe for some of you, it, it's, taking that step of more than just showing up and attending on a Sunday, but saying, hey, you know what, this year we're gonna make time because, right, let's be honest, nobody has time, but we're gonna make time to join a small group this year. We're gonna make time to jump on a serving team this year. And we're gonna be on mission together. We're gonna fight for unity. We're gonna be in this thing. How could you today work towards unity? Because remember, this isn't just a nice thing to do, but this is essential for us to accomplish the mission that Jesus gave us. Would you pray with me? Well, Lord, we thank you that God, thousands of years ago, you prayed for us. You prayed for Riverway. You prayed that we would be united, that there would be a sense of togetherness. And so God, I just pray that we would experience this perfect unity that you talk about. And that, God, that that would make your message to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to to the communities that we're trying to reach more believable because, God, they would see you at work in us. And so, God, we just ask all these things in your name. Amen.